Right, so as the uh, chairs are being removed from the stage, let me introduce our next speaker. You're all familiar with uh, programmatic uh, when it comes to mobile. You're probably also familiar with uh, programmatic from uh, outdoor and even cinema advertising. But what about the programmatic television? Arguably the final frontier, and one which perhaps isn't just driven by technology, but by big data as well. The Exchange Labs Executive Chairman is uh, here to talk to us about the future of programmatic TV. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chris Dobson. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm a, a regular visitor to Singapore. It's always nice to uh, visit, uh, even if it rains like it did last night. So, programmatic television, you don't hear about it very often. You do know that programmatic in the digital world is reshaping the way we think about trading very large audiences. And you do know that consumers are very much screen agnostic and they are moving from mobile to display to TV uh, in a way that the industry often takes a while to catch up with. And so far, TV, especially linear television, has been very quiet in, in any sort of revolution going forward. I guess I come from a sort of unique perspective whilst I work for one of the sort of world's leading independent programmatic specialists today, at least half my career has been in television, either in satellite television with, with MTV or back in the day uh, with ITV in the UK with linear television. And I know some of you are thinking, I wasn't born in 1980, um, so I must be about 86 on the basis of this career line. But uh, it's been an interesting journey, and I think what's happened is I've been able to observe how consumers have moved through media in that period, but also how uh, organizations have adopted new ways of, of behaving. Uh, and to be honest, the television industry is one that's not that keen on adopting new ways of behaving unless it's required to do so. And you could argue, and I'll make the case today, that the time is very close to that next revolution happening. Uh, and, and that the two industries of television and the way that we trade digital aren't quite so different as you might think. Obviously, state the obvious to, to start with, it's all about content. One thing I do believe is that content is at the center of the universe. Um, having worked for BBC Worldwide, having worked for MTV, having worked for various content organizations, uh, content plays the biggest part in consumers' lives. The fact is they consume it in a very different way. They're not told when they can consume it. They want to be able to be in control of that. And that's been reflected in where money has flowed. If you look, and this is the US, you're all well aware across every market, including Asia, that digital has overhauled every other media gradually. The one that sailed on unaffected was television. But this is an interesting chart because this is the sort of bastion of where TV really rules the roost still in the US. And there's two things to note from this chart. One, there is a downward trend in the TV revenue slope. That's the first time, really, that that's been seen. It's really been 50% of the market and not been affected. But digital will overtake television revenues uh, in the next few years. Now, this is going to be a forcing factor because this is one of the things that will affect the TV industry. And the other one, or many of you in this audience, the, the CMOs and the, and, the, and the marketers who demand more of a global view. So if you think about how TV and digital have evolved, there's a lot in common, much more in, 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 in the way that you might think. And in fact, consumers are forcing together TV and digital in those central areas around video, whether that be consumed on a mobile device, whether it's VOD, or the increasing um, use and a need to be social as, as you consume content. And as such, the only thing that really hasn't had a common ancestry, you know, if you think about digital going from original portals through search, 
you think about TV going through multi-channel, the way that the two are traded in terms of how audiences are traded are the two things that remain separate. Uh, but I believe that the forcing factor of those converging components is going to actually rapidly increase uh, the need to bring the two together. The other thing, which is incredibly important to most of you in this room, is how more sophisticated the consumer has become, how consumers don't go down a very neat funnel anymore, that there is a ton of interaction, social feedback, the route from awareness to purchase and loyalty is a complex one. But often in that circle, there's a gap. And that gap is where you have a wealth of data about your clients and your consumers, but you're unable to join that directly into your marketing effort. That's almost the secret source closing that circle. Uh, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that, because it's about um, first party data, really, the data that only you have about your customers. So let's take an example. We've talked about airlines today. Let's take an example of an airline just to bring it to life. If I buy a ticket uh, on Singapore Airlines, then only I and Singapore Airlines know when I'm flying and where I'm going. So that sort of relationship between the, the two of us is one that is a, is a very closed circle. Now, if Singapore Airlines know that, they can start to use that information to, you could say, help me on my journey. They know where my destination is. Uh, they know that I may be in a sort of window to buy travel insurance 48 hours before that flight. They know that I'm, I'm going to need a car when I get to my destination or a hotel. Their competitors don't know that. They don't know the detail of my flight. And therefore, this is a great way of creating loyalty, upsell, and cross-sell. And most of you in this room want that to be able to happen with that intimate knowledge you have of your client. And you want it to stay very close uh, to yourselves. You don't want it to leak out. Uh, and as such, you need all of your media to be working more closely together. And you can't really afford to think of media in separate silos anymore. So if you think about trading, is TV and digital that different? Are they completely different? I would say to you, actually, they're not. I think of inventory uh, in a sort of airline scenario as well, in terms of first class inventory, business class inventory, and coach inventory. So if you think about uh, digital, there's a long tail of digital impressions where a lot of direct response happens. And programmatic started in that space and has, as it's progressed, moved more and more towards the left of this graph because there's more and more premium inventory in play uh, from publishers. But the television situation is exactly the same. We used to call it peak and off-peak and daytime and nighttime. And guess what sort of advertising was in daytime and nighttime? Direct response advertising. And so premium means the same to both television and digital. The way they think around brands, um, the value of that inventory is very, very similar. And therefore, the way we should think about trading it shouldn't be that different either. And of course, TV's gone through explosions of um, diversification. It started, you know, this is a UK example, but it started with network television. It was a monopoly. It was a great place to work in those days because basically there was nowhere else to go. But then the satellite players and the cable players came along and it caused an explosion of channels. Now, this makes trading, if you're a media buyer or a seller of any of these channels, much more complicated. And there, once again, it's about audience as well as environment. And then finally, the new world happened. The Netflix of the world, the Amazons of the world. There's a lot of other places where video content is available and is available on your television. I was talking uh, over coffee to, to a client about Chromecast. Chromecast is a very small, simple device. Changes the nature of how you use your television. You know, you're watching movies that's coming via your phone and ending up on TV 
rather than through a satellite cable. And you can see why there's a lot of what they call cable cutters in the US, because they're being able to access content uh, in a very different way. And so that multi-channel pressure has been on television for a long time. The ability to trade across it has been more and more difficult. But now, with these new digital players that have a lot more data, uh, the challenge has got much more serious. But it's interesting, actually. The old world can teach the new world some, some tricks. I was, in, I was in, interested to see this. Better Call Saul, you may know, is the prequel to Breaking Bad. Half of you will have seen Breaking Bad and think it's the best thing in the world. Half of you will be wondering what we're all talking about. Um, you'll get there. The interesting thing, though, is that they're releasing a show a week. But surely Netflix is about binge viewing, three episodes at once. Not with this, because they realize that content is sticky. And that if you let it come out gradually, you may end up keeping people. But they also realize that, and we talked about facial recognition earlier. We're not quite there yet on most televisions, but where we are on, on Netflix is you do tell the television who you are. Because when you tell the television who you are, it gives you your content. And in fact, you don't get into Netflix, if there's four of you in your family, without ticking your face. So already the data that they have about who sat in front of that large screen is vastly superior to a normal television meter system, which is just an extrapolation. Not only that, TV companies themselves are involved in the convergence. Most have catch-up TV services in digital. Most are involved in the VOD world. And most are now, and this is an example of Downton Abbey, which is, which is released simultaneously on television and digital. So there's not even a delay. It's not even catch-up TV anymore. It's all platforms at once. So they have a conflict within their own organizations between the old and the new. But the interesting thing is, if you go back in the day, TV understands about auctions. When I was selling television in the 80s, we would change campaigns as they went along, re reflective of rating performance day by day. Does that sound familiar? That's what we do in programmatic. We change campaigns based on data that we have coming in. They started it. There was something called preemption, where a break could be you could get knocked out of a break by a higher bid. It doesn't sound too different to the programmatic world that we live in today. The only difference is it was entirely manual. And when you go and look at the things that we care about down the sort of left-hand side of this, of this chart, you can start to see that actually there's quite a lot in common, and there's some challenges on both sides of the fence. The biggest challenge for TV as it stands today is taking client conversion data into its system and acting against the client's KPIs based on the client's data. The programmatic business is very good at doing that. You might also argue that in terms of changing consumer demand, we would claim in the programmatic space that we do that minute by minute. Uh, it sort of takes a bit longer in television. You, know, it needs, you need to launch a catch-up catch -up series. You're not basically able to be agnostic to screen. Uh, quite so much. But where TV, has to be said, has always won, it's a very scalable medium. It takes billions of dollars in very well, and all the margins are well understood. Uh, I can't say that that's necessarily the, the case within the programmatic system at the moment, which is, as you know, very complex, sometimes a little opaque. So both have got things to learn from each other, but both have common themes that are making trading much more feasible across both of those screens. But there's some common challenges. You heard this quote earlier, actually. Uh, this guy who actually made the first quote, and P&G have talked about this too, uh, it, was, it was 100 years ago. And so the whole idea of wastage, the whole idea of really being sure whether all of your um, media budget is really going to where you need it to be in front of consumers in an effective way was a problem at the very beginning. I think this guy ran a shop, and he had advertising, but he didn't really realize how it was going. And then, of course, there's one of the things that we talk about a lot in the digital world these days, viewability. 
that's a real problem for digital. Well, actually, it's not. It's been a real problem for everything. When I was selling television in the 80s, the agencies in London couldn't see the ads going out in Birmingham or Newcastle. So they employed people to sit in front of the television, watch the ads go out, and fill in a questionnaire and send it back to the agency as a verification that the ad had actually been transmitted. So it, it was always an issue. If you couldn't see it happening, you weren't quite sure it had happened. If you look at newspapers, in the UK, the Sunday Times is a very big newspaper. If you've caught sight of the front page for two minutes, you're, caught, you're called a reader. If you bought an ad in one of the supplements, do you really think that's necessarily as reliable? I don't think so. It's been an issue. Outdoor, even more. I mean, there are new studies with GPS trackers and samples and what have you, but the reality of how sure are we that outdoor is this key? We're not. And I think viewability in the digital space is exactly the same. It is something we need to address, especially when you're putting brands in front of, of, of consumers, because you need to be sure that what you're buying is being seen, or at least can be seen. So this is an issue that we need to solve, but it's an issue that the entire advertising industry has had to solve for a long time. The big thing, though, which we absolutely have to solve is cross-device integration. We've still got that problem between display and mobile in terms of cookies or not cookies. Uh, and whilst we have a sort of go at it, there is TV Sync, Sync which you've probably heard of, where the TV ad actually creates an auction in the companion device that's sat on a consumer's lap and actually ties the two advertising experiences together. Um, that's one way of forcing the two together. But actually, we have to do a much better job at integrating um, true cross-device, where TV is one of those devices. We don't sort of think of TV as one of those devices today. And then, of course, there's the whole thing around data standards. I went viewability. There is no definition of viewability. There are many companies creating um, data. There are many companies that provide data to you as advertisers. Um, there are no necessarily common standards across them, and that's something, too, that we need to address. A single source of the truth, at least for each of you as individual advertisers, is going to be incredibly important so you have the validity of what you're seeing. So how do you bring it all together? And this is where technology comes into play. You need workflow, and you need technology to help you do all of what you're doing. You need to be able to define value. You need to understand what's working, what's not working in real time, and where and that, an attribution comes into this. But then you've got to be able to action that. And you've got to be able to action it in real time. And this is where the real challenge is. You've got to be able to do this at scale. There are, would you believe, 50 billion impressions just in digital in play every day. How on earth are you going to do that without technology to help you? Those of you that are involved in programmatic are finding that unless you've got technology to help you, it's incredibly time consuming. And in fact, look, this is a good example. This is an example from my business. Uh, we have a platform called Proteus, which is what we use to scale what we do programmatically. And if you don't have it, if you use a single DSP on the left hand side there, the entire time that it takes to run a campaign is represented by that, those minutes. Time you get to the center bar and you want to run five DSPs at once, you're talking an awful lot of time. But with technology, and on the far right bar, if you've got technology overlaid, you can do five DSPs for mu not much more time than you could have done one manually. So you can scale. And billions of dollars are in play here and will be in play in the next few years. So you need the technology, and TV needs to be integrated into this. In terms of judging value, this is one of the reports that we use. Clients get to see which tactics are working, which suppliers of inventory are working or not working on a daily basis if they want it, probably on a weekly basis more, more reasonably. But you need to be able to see and judge value in real time so you can make those changes just like TV always used to 
uh, but in a much more sophisticated way. And in order to do that, you've got to be able to action it. This is a view of, of our trading screen where multiple campaigns sit in front of a trader uh, and he can see by this particular configuration which of those campaigns are on target, off target, still waiting for client data. But the big thing is he can action changes from this screen into multiple sources of inventory. And those multiple sources of inventory have to include television very soon. We can't leave that screen out. So what's stopping um, TV jumping in? Well, you've first got to believe that your yield will go up if you get involved with auctions. And anybody who uses eBay knows there's a dynamic between the buy it now price and the bid price. This particular example, the bid price was higher than the buy it now price because there was a little bit of frenzy at the end of the auction. So does TV believe that the Super Bowl could get more money from being auctioned in real time than being pre-sold? The jury's out on that. But you could argue that when you go back to that sort of first class piece, peak is where the auction could really drive value for TV companies. It's a trading methodology. It's nothing more than that. So what's stopping and what's going to make the change for television? Well, the first one is that TV has been very happy, thank you very much, for 30 years, traded in much the same way as it always has been traded. Um, and so far, it's been fine. It's sort of thought as bomb-proof, really. It doesn't matter what all these other media are doing. TV sails on. But as you can see, in the home of television in the US, that last bastion, the slope is now going down. Also, I had a debate with some TV um, sales directors not long ago, and there was this sort of pervasion of programmatic was a sort of us and them, but actually programmatic is just a way of trading. It doesn't necessarily uh, take over television. It just enables television as another way of them driving yield. It's not quite believed yet uh, in television. Can yield go up? We believe it can. We see it in the digital world, especially as more and more premium inventory becomes available. We see, see yields going up for publishers. TV's got to be convinced that that's going to be the case. And of course, you've got to have technology that's going to be able to run a cross-platform with this common data so that we can really start to see cross-device, including television. So those are the things that are sort of stopping TV doing this. But what's going to actually make TV move forward more quickly? Well, actually, some internal pressure. Television is about digital as well as linear television these days. And there's internal pressure to bring together their own offerings so that they can go to clients uh, and integrate their VOD and catch-up offerings uh, seamlessly with their linear offering, which they can't do today. Data is the secret of all uh, digital media, and it's still the weak link in television. The disruptors are improving data from television and television screens. And that data integration, driven largely by the desires of marketers and CMOs, will drive change. Clients have got a lot here to sort of help the system through by asking your agencies and your suppliers to be more integrated, by de-siloing your budgets, by letting the consumers tell you where money should be spent, uh, it's going to force change. And actually, of course, no, there's nothing like a burning platform. If you start to see yields go down and you start to see revenue slide, then it will force change. And I think that change is coming in the, in the next couple of years. And certainly in, in many territories of the world, that's been accelerated by the disruptors. You know, you see the quality of content that the Netflix of, these world, of the world are, are producing. A lot of money is being spent on content. There's a lot of cable cutting going on in some markets. Uh, and if you look at Asia, the way that video is consumed and how prevalent mobile is in that space, 
Um, and as the last speaker was talking about, the power of Wi-Fi actually on mobile devices is a big driver for the mobile screen. But the mobile screen itself, with much higher resolution, is as good an experience as a TV 12 foot away. And so there's a big change coming in terms of the way that content is consumed, and it's already here. If anything, Asia leads the way, as it always has, in the mobile first uh, scenario. And once somebody has a system, not unlike the system that we use, that can start to scale trading across multiple screens, it's going to be an enabler for TV to join the fold as the last screen. And obviously, there's a sense of urgency. Uh, I think what was interesting around the whole programmatic business was that Enabler just doubled their assessment. Last year, more than 50% of all digital inventory in, in the US was traded programmatically. That's three years ahead of schedule. It is accelerating at a great rate. The industry is embracing it. It is going to be important that this change happens sooner rather than later. And ultimately, we'll get to a point where we don't talk about the two things differently. We don't talk about digital providers and TV providers as being anything different. Everything will be content, tradable in a digital way, uh, in an increasingly automated way, which allows it to scale. And that's the big change that you're going to see in the next couple of years. And I think that's a change you're going to see in Asia um, as fast as anywhere else. Um, often led by the US, and the US has been very quick um, to move in this direction. But it's all about publishers, too. And more and more publishers are embracing uh, the new way forward and accelerating the change. And I guess, you know, I'll finish on an interesting quote from one of our clients who actually used um, unbidden uh, an analogy between how we operate and how TV operates. There is an increasing demand from those of you that buy and evaluate media to be able to think of it as in a holistic way. You don't want to be siloed. You don't want to have a mobile budget, a TV budget. You want consumers to help you put that budget where it's going to be most effective for your particular brand, for your particular audience. And that, above all, uh, will drive the next revolution. And I really believe that the programmatic space is as big as the revolution that's happened in digital, and that this time, TV will be coming along uh, and embrace it, because frankly, there won't be a choice. Thanks very much. Thank you. Chris Dobson from the Exchange Lab. For a while, uh, I couldn't tell whether you were working at the BBC in an on-camera or off-camera uh, role. Thank you, Chris. And by the way, if you have questions for Chris, the Exchange Lab is represented here with an exhibition space just outside uh, nearby Microsoft and Bloomberg's, which you'll be able to check out during the lunch break.